In 2019, a bombshell documentary premiered that pushed the Michael Jackson sexual abuse allegations into the limelight. In August 2023, a California court gave the go-ahead to take it to trial. If you're wondering what the case is all about, this is the recap for you. Welcome to True Crime Recaps, I'm Chris. If this is your first time or your 20th time watching a recap, but you still haven't hit that subscribe button, do it right now so you never miss a recap. Amy and I are bringing you all the crime in halftime right here every week, and we can't wait for you to join us. Now, on with the recap. Few televised funerals have amassed over a billion worldwide viewers. You have Princess Diana in 1997, Pope John Paul II in 2005, and Muhammad Ali in 2016. But one man's funeral holds the record with between 2.5 and 3 billion people watching around the world. The king of pop, Michael Jackson. 40% of the global population tuned in to say goodbye to their favorite singer, idol, and immortalized icon. For some, they were saying good riddance to a monster. For all of Michael's talent, you can't ignore the sexual assault allegations dating back to 1993. At the same time, there are many red flags, contradictions, and ulterior motives attached to many of these assault stories. Ignoring those is impossible. Like all highly controversial topics, people have made and recanted statements. They've said things behind closed doors and professed opposite opinions in public. Some take sides before hearing the whole story. For others, the flip side of the coin doesn't matter. In 2019, a bombshell documentary titled Leaving Neverland refocused our attention on the Michael Jackson sexual abuse saga. The Michael Jackson story is a dicey topic, to say the least. The allegations against him have been piling up over three decades. Several victims have come forward claiming Michael sexually abused them when they were children. He manipulated their families, brainwashed and gaslit them, only to cast them aside when they got too old. The most famous name that comes to mind is Macaulay Culkin and his relationship with the late pop star. But many people get his story wrong, which we'll get into later on. After combing Neverland Ranch in 2003, the FBI never found any evidence of wrongdoing. Images have been doctored over the years to push narratives and one way or the other. Wade Robson and James Safe Chuck met Michael in the late 1980s. They were both trying to break into show business as fledgling child stars. When James was 10, he starred in this 1987 Pepsi commercial. Mr. Jackson? In it, James plays a boy who sneaks into Michael Jackson's dressing room and dons his iconic clothing. Five-year-old Wade from Australia met Michael during a local dance competition. The kids were doing their best Michael Jackson impressions as the bad tour came through in 1988. Michael liked both boys and promised to help their show business careers. He'd bring them on tour and shower them with lavish gifts and vacations. Wade was already spellbound by Michael. His walls were plastered with posters and he grew up emulating the King's dance moves. James's mother didn't know how often her son was left alone with Michael. Things allegedly turned darker when their hotel rooms were booked on different floors. Michael Jackson bought the land that would eventually become Neverland Ranch in 1988. It's a 2,700-square-acre property equipped with railroads and amusement park rides. From the outside, it was a child's dream. Wade claims his abuse started after Michael bought Neverland. When Wade was seven years old, Michael convinced his parents to let him stay alone on the ranch for five days. Michael allegedly told him they were brought together by God, then performed sexual acts on him. During James's stay, Michael allegedly hosted a mock wedding for the pair. He even presented little James with a ring that he says he still has today. When they'd go on tour, Michael allegedly made James practice getting dressed as quickly as possible. If someone came into the hotel room, they wouldn't suspect anything. One of the more graphic moments in Leaving Neverland is when Wade describes 
rests with Michael. Both men also describe Neverland Ranch as an easy place to hide abuse. The hallway leading to Michael's bedroom featured several locks, doors, and bells. If someone was coming, he'd know long before they arrived. Other areas like the upper levels, attic, and train station were more secluded. As they got older, Wade and James claimed Jackson pushed them aside in favor of younger boys. Michael began hanging around Brett Barnes and Home Alone star Macaulay Culkin. Both Brett and Macaulay have been two of Michael's most devoted defenders. They claim Jackson never touched them. Another of those replacement boys was 12-year-old Jordan Jordy Chandler. As the story goes, Michael's car broke down in Beverly Hills. He had it towed to a local garage whose owner was a big fan. He called his wife to come meet Michael. She brought her son from a previous marriage, Jordan Chandler, to meet the King of Pop. Jordan's biological father, Evan Chandler, was a dentist who was known to treat celebrities. He also co-wrote the screenplay for Robin Hood, Men in Tights. The tabloids described the Chandlers as Michael's new adopted family. He'd invite Jordy, his stepsister, and their mom to spend weekends on the Neverland Ranch. They'd also take lavish trips to Vegas and Florida. When Jordan's stepfather called Evan to discuss the boy's relationship with Michael, the stepfather recorded this phone call. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen. Beyond his, beyond his worst nightmares, sell one more record. This attorney I found. I mean, I interviewed several, and I picked the nastiest I can find. Once I make that phone call, this guy is just going to destroy everybody in sight. Any devious, nasty, cruel way that he can do it. And I've given him full authority to do that. <laughs> It'll be a, a massacre if I don't get what I want. If I go through with this, I win big time. I will get everything I want, and they will be, told, they will be destroyed forever. They will be destroyed. June is going to lose Jordy. She will have no right to ever see him again. Yeah. That's a fact, Dave. That's what's going that help Michael's career will be over. Does that help Jordy? Michael's career will be over. And does that help Jordy? That's irrelevant to me. When the story broke in 1993, James and Wade say Michael coerced them into defending him. Their families went on TV and spoke highly of Michael. Wade says it put him back in Michael's good graces. He was his favorite boy again. The 1993 allegations against Michael Jackson ended in an out-of-court settlement. Michael paid roughly $20 million to the Chandler family without admitting guilt. Of course, Many people consider a settlement to be in an informal admission of guilt, but there are some interesting facts about the case worth noting. According to GQ, Evan demanded a screenwriting deal from Michael. If Michael granted him the $20 million production deal, he wouldn't go to the police. Michael's team said no. Then there's the fact that Evan was the only person making allegations against Michael. That changed after he drugged his son during a procedure at his dental office. He administered sodium amytal, which is a controversial sedative that has been found to allow for the implantation of false memories. It was under the influence of this drug that Jordan made his first allegations. The rest is history. According to some sources, Michael settled the civil suit for $20 million because he risked losing $100 million if he spent too much time in court. He also wanted to focus on the criminal trial, which obviously carried more weight. In the summer of 1994, the investigation fell apart and was closed after the Chandlers stopped cooperating. Jordan allegedly fled the country and Instead of testifying, without their star witness, the case couldn't move forward. Coincidentally, this was after the Chandlers got their money. That same year, Jordan legally emancipated from his parents. In 2006, he accused his father of attacking him with a dumbbell, spraying him with mace, and choking him. Those charges were ultimately dropped. Then, Evan Chandler killed himself 14 weeks after Jackson's death in 2009. According to Leaving Neverland director Dan Reed, Jordan isn't easy to find these days. He was given a new identity and currently resides somewhere in New York. Allegations on the Jackson front calmed down until the early 2000s. Then, Michael invited 12-year-old Gavin Arvizo to be part of the ITV documentary Living with Michael Jackson. Gavin was a sick kid. He was going through chemo and recently had his kidney and spleen removed. Michael and Gavin became friends and his family was invited to Neverland. Living with Michael Jackson is the doc that spawned this infamous clip. His comments raised every eyebrow in America 
America, why are children sharing a bedroom with a grown man? It was 1993 all over again. Jackson was arrested in November 2003. He was charged with multiple counts of child molestation, providing alcohol to a minor, and even conspiring to hold Gavin and his family captive. He was looking at serious jail time. That's when Macaulay Culkin went to bat for Michael on Larry King Live. Well, the thing is, the thing is with that whole thing, is that, you know, they go, oh, you slept in the same bedroom as him. It's like, I don't think you understand. Michael Jackson's bedroom is two stories. <laughs> and it has like like three bathrooms and this and that. So when I slept in his bedroom, yeah, but you have to understand the whole scenario. And the thing is with Michael, is that he's not very good at explaining himself, and he never really has been, because he's not a very social person. I mean, he's, you're talking about someone who's been sheltered and sheltering himself also for the last, like, 30 years, or, you know, and so he's not very good at communicating to people and not very good at conveying what he's actually trying to say to you. And so when he says something like that, you know, people, you know, he doesn't quite understand why people react the way that they do. While covering the court case, Rolling Stone described it as a homecoming parade of grifters, suckers, and no-talent schemers looking to cash in any way they can. Everything imploded. It was proven that witnesses had either stolen from Jackson, had a grudge against Jackson, or had profited off selling their stories to tabloids. Here's where Wade Robson and James Safechuck re-enter the picture. At the 2005 trial, Wade tested testified that nothing sexual ever happened between him and Michael. In Leaving Neverland, he said he was coerced to lie under oath. His mother allegedly said, you and Macaulay Culkin are the only two people in the world who can save him. In the documentary, he tells a gripping story about having dinner with Michael and his family the night before he testified. He said seeing Jackson's children and the empty look on Michael's face compelled him to lie. However, Michael's nephew, who was present at the time, took to Twitter saying this dinner happened after Wade had already testified. He claims that the statements in Leaving Neverland weren't true. Since the film's release, several other documentaries have come out defending Michael. The Jackson estate called it a tabloid character assassination. Jackson biographers have also poked some holes in the documentary. For example, James claims Michael sexually assaulted him at the Neverland train station between 1988 and 1992. However, that train station wasn't built until 1994. Dan Reed says James simply has his dates wrong, that the abuse lasted long after. However, the range 1988 to 1992 is written multiple times in court documents and statements made by James. Nobody is denying that Michael Jackson's relationship relationship with young children was unusual. Macaulay Culkin attempted to explain this on Larry King in 2004. Why do you think he likes young people so much? It's because it, it's the same reason why he liked me, was the fact that I didn't care who he was. That was the thing. I talked to him like he was a normal human being. And that's what, and, and kids do that to him because he's not, I mean, he's Michael Jackson, the pop singer, but he's not the god of, you know, the king of pop or anything like that. He's just, you know, a guy who's actually very kid-like himself and wants to go out there and wants to play video games with you. Did your parents like encourage that. it? Um, I, they weren't against it. It's also worth noting that Wade approached the Jackson estate in 2011 about directing the Michael Jackson Cirque du Soleil production one. Sources say he wanted the job badly, but they went with somebody else. In 2012, as his career was beginning to crumble, he began shopping a book that claimed he was sexually abused by Michael Jackson. No publishers took him up on it. James Safechuck says that he only realized he was abused by Jackson after seeing Wade talk about it on TV in 2013. Both filed multi-million dollar civil lawsuits against Michael's production companies. They claim the staff aided in their abuse by leaving them alone with Michael when they were kids. Those lawsuits were dismissed in 2017 because the statute of limitations had expired. But the stories they had to tell were revived after Leaving Neverland premiered. Fast forward to 2021 and Wade and James brought their case back to court after the California governor signed a new law in 2020 extending the statute for child sexual abuse allegations. But their cases were again dismissed. Then in 2023, three appellate court judges ruled in their favor, giving the case the green light to go in front of a jury. If they are telling the truth, their stories are heartbreaking. But the question of are they, aren't they, remains controversial. Jackson's camp calls them liars, but others say they're telling the truth. He also said the former executive director of MJJ Productions once told him and his wife never to leave children alone with Jackson. The lawyer for Michael's estate had this to say about this recent turn of events. We trust that the truth will ultimately prevail with Michael's vindication yet again. Again, Michael Jackson himself said, lies run sprints, but the truth runs marathons. We'll see how this latest saga plays out. In the meantime, 
What do you think of these allegations? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.